Be welcoming those that are watching online today. What a day. There is good news. That's what we're going to talk about today, good news. How many think that our world needs some good news? I want to jump right in if I can. 2 Corinthians chapter 15, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of all, most of whom are all still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Let me just highlight that for a minute. You know, we're here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and for some people we think of that as sort of a fairy tale or just something we, we talk about, a nice thing, but this text right here is talking about a, a, a specific event that happened that was witnessed. In fact, when it was written, it said Jesus appeared alive after being crucified to over 500 people at the same time. In fact, many of them are still here. That's when it was written. If you have doubts or questions, you can go talk to them. How many, are, how many of you are glad that what we're here to celebrate really happened? I mean, this is a real event that really happened. <laughs> then he appeared to James, his brother, to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, as we come to you, we come to you grateful for all you've done in our life. We're here to celebrate, Jesus, all you have done, not just in our life, but in so many people's lives around the world. We pray, God, even now that you would help us to appreciate and to honor this gift that we've been given in Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that you know every individual that's here. You know every situation. You care about them more than anybody else, including this pastor. So I thank you that you're going to give them exactly what they need tonight, today, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Our world is at war. It's happening all around us. It always has from the very beginning. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar. There's a fascinating story about a Japanese soldier named Hiro Inoda. And uh, he was a Japanese soldier of the fall in World War II. And uh, obviously most of us, maybe all, none of us have, you know, personal memories of World War II, but uh, certainly maybe through history, you know, it was a war unlike any other war. And so much was at stake. And it wasn't just a regional skirmish and some people having it out around some boundaries or something that happened, but the whole world was engaged, and the stakes were, were so high that the, the world as we know it would change depending on which way and which direction the war, the war would go. And uh, September the 2nd, 1945, Japan surrendered, ending World War II. And yet, Hiro Inoda is known as the last Japanese soldier to surrender. In those days, obviously, it wasn't like our days where, you know, when something happens, news travels really fast. And so after that event happened, it took some time so that everybody around the world knew that the war was over. And some people, specifically in jungles or, or, or in areas that were difficult to reach, you know, it was hard to get to them. And so over, some, over time, eventually, it found its way there. But, but Inoda was told to never surrender, and he was told that he was, his commanding officer would come get him for him to stay his post until that happened. And so that didn't happen, so he stayed his post. And it wasn't until September of 1974 that he finally surrendered in World War II, 29 years after the war had ended. Now, the West had dropped flyers, uh, letting people in the jungle, because there's lots of people in that situation know that the war was over, and in fact, Anoda found one of these pamphlets and he read about Japan surrendering and 
about how the war was over, but he wouldn't believe it. In fact, he thought it was propaganda. So instead, he stayed his post and he lived off the land and survived off of what he could. He carried on missions. And I just think that this is an intriguing story that he was fighting World War II 29 years after the war was over. And it gets me thinking because I, I, perhaps some of us here to, today are still fighting a war that's over. And I know there's battles, there's challenges, but maybe you're not aware that the war is over. And this is what Paul is getting at. He says, I want to remind you of the gospel. Now, I don't know what comes to mind when you hear the word gospel, but my guess is, is for some of us, it, it's just a religious word, and you might not fully understand what it, what it means, or maybe, maybe you're a Christian yourself and maybe you haven't fully grasped the implications of this word. Maybe you just think about you know, someone passing out a track or a style of music. I don't know what comes to mind when you hear the word gospel, but the word gospel is, is translated from the original word euangelion. Euangelion is, is how we get the word gospel, and the, the literal definition of gospel is good news. Gospel means good news. Everybody say good news. The gospel means good news. In fact, it's not a religious word at all. When it was used originally, it was more of a political word. In fact, used specifically about a military conquest. It would be an announcement of some breaking news of something that happened that was passed on and shared that would reach its hearers in a very positive way. And in that setting, it was meant to speak to people who were in the turmoil of war and to give them the security that they, not, that they need to know that the, the war they're fighting is over. Or the war that's being waged that will impact them even if they're not fighting it is over. And so the, the fear would be relieved around uh, being slaves or being oppressed by an oppressor that sought to conquer them. And they don't have to be afraid no more. They know, they're no longer in danger. There's no longer a threat. And they can go back to normal living. This is what the gospel is. It's like breaking news that changes everything. You know, I know we live in a day and age where now we have the 24-hour news cycle. We have cable television and cable news sources, plenty of channels, Depending on whatever variety of news you like, you can watch news all day long, social media. I mean, we have technology at our disposal where news travels really quick. But before the internet, you know, how many of you remember the day that you watched the news one time a night? Came on one time a day. Or maybe in the morning. But in the evening, you got the national news and you got the local news and you got a newspaper every day. People read the newspaper. But on the rare occasion... There would be breaking news that was so important that the, if you're watching a television show, that they thought it was important enough to interrupt their regularly scheduled programming to give you a news headline. And this, of course, happened several different times. In 1980, Howard Cosell broke on to Monday Night Football announcing that John Lennon was shot and killed. In 1963, a soap opera was playing as the world turns and Walter Cronkite interrupts to announce that JFK was shot. And some of you probably remember September the 11th, 2001, watching the Today Show as planes hit the World Trade Center. And from that moment on, the world has never been the same. These powerful moments that, that, that change everything. And we have these moments and we're accustomed to them largely uh, being about some kind of negative catastrophe, something that happens that changes everything. And yet, this headline that we get changes everything, but in a different way. In fact, it sounds like Luke chapter 2, in the very beginning, when Jesus came to the, to the earth and he was born, the angels announced and saying, Behold, today I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, in Bethlehem, a Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. That's good news. J.R. Tolkien obviously wrote The Lord of the Rings, and um, he coined the phrase, a catastrophe." 
and wrote the story of the Lord of the Rings based on a eucatastrophe. And a eucatastrophe meaning something cataclysmic that changes everything, but you meaning in a positive way, a good catastrophe. And of course, the destruction of the ring of power would usher in the, the old or usher out the old and bring in the new. And this is, this is what we've come to celebrate. So I've come to interrupt your regularly scheduled programming today to announce to you that Jesus is, in fact, alive. Yes, there's good news. Jesus, he came because of love. He lived a sinless life, falsely accused and tried, hung on a cross and died. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, he he rose again. This is the good news. And my fear is we kind of skip over it or we miss it. We don't see it as significant. Or we see it, you know, that's like the ABCs of Christianity. It's time to move on to the more, more advanced teachings. Well, I love what Tim Keller says. He says the gospel is not just the ABCs of the Christian life, but it's the A to Z of the Christian life. That in many ways, we gotta circle back around to help us to understand and appreciate this thing that Jesus has come to do because it shapes and changes everything else. Somebody say amen to that. The gospel, that's why Paul says it's of first importance. And so I know for some of us, you know, we're followers of Jesus, we're Christians, or maybe you have a church background. Well, today might just be a reminder and uh, as a pastor, I, I'm, I'm under the persuasion that most people need reminding more than they need instructing because we drift and we, we, we wander and we leak. You know, we don't, ca- we don't keep information that we need and we have a tendency to wander away. And for others of you, I love this about our church is that there's lots of people that come to our church don't have a church background. Maybe you haven't been to church or maybe you haven't even heard this message or you don't even know. Super glad that you're here. So this may be more information for you. But I wanna talk about the implications of the gospel because I think if we're not careful, we live in a day and age where we are, it just becomes a religious pep rally or a motivational talk where we're looking for self-help but without really fully understanding how powerful the gospel is in transforming people's lives. That's what we've come to lean in on and look on. So I wanna talk about the four things that the gospel does. And the first thing is this, it means I'm not a slave. I'm not a slave. When the war is over, the people who once lived in slavery or the fear of being oppressed by their enemy don't have to be afraid anymore. In the Bible, you might be surprised to know, says that we as sinners, that we are slaves to sin, that we are bound to sin, that our sinful nature controls us. We are prone to wander and to rebel and to leave God. And as a result, all of us in this room, the Bible says we've all fallen short of the glory of God, that there's no one that is sinless. There's no one righteous, not even one of us. And so we all walk through life carrying a lot of decisions and a lot of wandering. We all struggle with our fallen shortness. And at times trying to figure out what do we do with it? So we medicate it or we try to conquer it. And, and then yet that it's not really found that way. And before Jesus came on, the only hope that we had was we covered over it for a period of time, but there it was all all the more. But what Jesus came to do, he came to liberate us from the bondage of, of sin and to provide us with something we all long for and want, and that is to finally and fully be forgiven of everything that we've ever done to oppose God. Forgiveness is possible. You don't have to walk around with your shame and your guilt anymore. You can have a clear conscience before God because he, he embraces you and he receives you exactly how you are. And if you trust him with your life, he forgives you of everything that you've ever done that violated anything he's ever asked you to do. That's good news. Ephesians chapter two says, but God is so rich in mercy. Everybody say rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Now, I don't know what your opinion of God is. There's a lot of people that are misguided about who God is or how he acts, but this verse and many other verses tells us something really important, that God, we serve a God who is rich in mercy, that he abounds in mercy. 
that he's got more than enough mercy for us. And I know that some of us, our view of God is that he's, he's rich in wrath, not rich in mercy. He, he's easily angered and he's ticked off about the things that we do. And while the Bible certainly says that he gets angry, how many are grateful that he's slow to get angry? But he's abounding in love and rich in mercy. I don't know about you, but I need God's mercy. And the word mercy means not getting something you deserve. Not getting something you deserve. And we've probably all been there. Uh, we probably all had the, a shared experience. This happened to me this week. But we were driving across the Three Mile Bridge. And maybe if you've been there, you've noticed that it's full expanded. So it's big, nice, brand new. You can finally drive across it. And when you drive across the Three Mile Bridge and you get, you, 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 you get to three miles and you drive into Gulf Breeze, what is important for you to do at that moment? That's right, you guys have all been there. You better slow down. Now you better slow down because you wanna keep everybody safe, but what's the other reason you better slow down? Because they gonna get you. And sure enough, this week I was driving, well I was in the passenger seat. Somebody else was driving. They will remain nameless, but it wasn't Kristen, all right? Just to protect her, it was not Kristen. So I'm sitting in the passenger seat, and we just enjoyed driving across the three-mile bridge and the three lanes that's there, cruising, and all of a sudden we get past the three-mile bridge, and, and right as we get off the three-mile bridge, I look to my left, and there's one of our public servants sitting there right, right there waiting to greet us into Santa Rosa County. And as soon as that happened, they noticed it. How many of you slam on your brakes real quick? You know. And uh, so, and then we drive past that wonderful public servant. And we drive past him. He's sitting right there. And you know the moment when you, when you know you're, you're doing something you shouldn't do. And you see the guy that's supposed to catch you when you're doing something you shouldn't do. And you're waiting with bated breath to see if he's going to pull out behind you, Right? Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? You been there before? Sweating, praying. And sure enough, we drove past and he didn't pull out. And then all of a sudden I looked to the right and he had one of his buddies on the other side of the road. He whipped right out, <laughs> right behind us. I'm like, oh, it's on. And then boom, the, the lights come on. And I don't know who you are, but in that moment, but as soon as you see the lights come on behind you like that, you go into panic mode. It's like 10 and 2. Turn the radio down, pull your seat up to where you're leaning straight up, right? You're like, what did I do with the registration? Fumbling through it, right? That's that moment you're like in trouble and you know you're busted. And so finally, the, you know, the, the policeman, he comes to the window and he, you know, license registration. And of course he says what, he, what they say every time they pull you over. And they say, do you know why I'm pulling you over? And, you know, you always say no, even though you know why they're pulling you over. So the guy says, you're going 55 miles an hour in a 35-mile-an-hour zone. Which, by the way, can we just all agree, 35 miles an hour is way too slow to be driving around there in Gulf Breeze. <laughs> Let's write the county commissioners or something. I don't know. So anyway, he says, okay, so well, sorry, so I'm thinking this is gonna be a big bill here. So the police officer goes back to his car, he says, I'll be right back, sir. And so, you know, there's like that three minutes, three to five minutes where you're sitting there. I mean, it's, you're praying in tongues. It's getting that kind of serious. You know, you're like, God, do something in this moment. <laughs> and, uh, and so finally, we were there, and the police officer comes back and says, sir, do you know how much a ticket is for going 55 and a 35? Like, no, no, sir, I don't. And he says, that's a $270 ticket. I'm like, that's expensive. And then he says, but you know what? I'm gonna let you go with a warning today. That's a wonderful feeling, ain't it? That's called $270 worth of mercy. Sometimes we can't fully appreciate mercy until we can add a value to it. Right? Five bucks, 10 bucks, no big deal. 270, that's a lot. Super grateful. And of course, you know, for us, our sin debt was way more than that. 
And what we owed, I mean, the Bible says we've all fallen short and the wages of sin is death. Like the, the consequences of not meeting the mark and the standard is to forever be away from the presence of God. Nothing we could do about it. And yet Jesus, he comes and he affords us the opportunity to be forgiven of our sin. Come on, how many are grateful that God forgives us of all of our sin, even the stuff that hangs over our head? The second thing it means, it means I'm good. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm good. Go ahead, I'm good. Now, this is that phrase we use when we're, you know, there's something going on between in our relationship. Let's just say it this way. In our marriage, sometimes when your husband, you know that something is wrong. And so you ask your husband, what's the matter? And how does your husband respond? I'm good. And usually when that happens, they say I'm good, we know they're not good, but what I'm good means in that setting is, is I'm not good, but I don't wanna talk about how I'm not good. So I'll just say I'm good. And in, and in this situation, what this means for us is mercy means we don't get what we deserve, but there's something else that we get. That Jesus is not just saying you, you don't get something, but instead he's saying I'm gonna give you something. And that's what grace is. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting something that you don't deserve. That he gives us a gift. Not, it, the, the good news is even more ridiculous than you don't have to pay, your, pay for your sins. More than that, you get something on top of not getting something you didn't deserve. And you get, most specifically, you get Jesus' record, not your own. The Bible says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. That means that when, G when God looks at you, if you've trusted Jesus with your life and you've sought his forgiveness, that God does not see all those bad things that you did in 88. He doesn't see what you did two summers ago. He doesn't see the haunted things that hangs over your head. Instead, he sees what Jesus did and Jesus' record becomes your own, that he, he gives us his righteousness. Now we are made right with God. We are good, as if we never did anything. How many of you know there's a difference between innocent and not guilty? You know, you can get off of a charge if you got a good lawyer, if they don't have the proper evidence, and they'll say not guilty, but that doesn't mean you're innocent. It just means you don't have to pay. The Bible says in Jesus, we are blameless. We are more than not guilty. We are innocent that God sees us as holy because we've trusted Jesus and his record becomes our own. That's why it's good news. Come on, somebody say amen. And if you're starting to say this sounds too good, then you're just getting to scratch the surface of how good it is. But more than that, it's not just you're forgiven and you're good, but number three, it means you're now reconciled back to God, which is the purpose and the point of all this. This isn't just dealing with your sin and giving you a new nature. The purpose of Jesus coming to the earth and coming and dying for us is so that we could be reestablished in a relationship with God that we lost as a result of our wandering. First Peter 3 says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for unrighteous. Here's the key, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Let us not misunderstand. Trusting Jesus is not just about being forgiven and about having another opportunity to serve God. No, this is about God bringing, bringing us back to himself where we can have a close relationship with him again. And some of you may not articulate it this way. You may not think that it's a big pressing need, but can I tell you, the big burden of us all is cosmic separation. The dissatisfaction that you feel in your heart, the emptiness with success even, or the hopelessness and despair that you feel with failure is not just because you're off. It means there's the whole world's off in their relationship with God. And the purpose of Jesus coming is to bring us back so that we could be restored and reconciled to God. That's, God's, that's his heart for you. He wants to know you. He wants to be known by you. He wants to, like he did with Adam in the garden, to walk with you in the cool of the day without anything that's hindering. And that's why next week when we did the series called Glitch, that's what we're gonna talk about is how we can reestablish that connection that we lost. 
But finally, the fourth thing, and I want to finish with this. Here's what the good news means. It means I, can, I have courage for today because I have confidence about tomorrow. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what challenge you have right now, what burden you're carrying, what struggle you have, but I will say this. Everybody in this room has a current struggle. Everybody in this room. Many people in here are walking through terrible challenges and overwhelming things. It could be a health issue. It could be a financial thing. It could be a relation. I don't know what it is, but I know because I know a lot of people in this room, and if you're here today and you're overwhelmed because you have a lot going on and it's understandable that when you look at what's happening in your life, when you're looking at this world, it would be so easy to be overwhelmed, anxious, afraid, maybe even anger, angry. And a message like this, there is good news, is not meant to diminish the reality, the pain, and the struggle that so many of you feel. And it's not even meant to diminish the reality of the struggle that we see in the world around us. But I want you to know that the gospel, the good news that we have, doesn't mean we stick our head in the sand to the challenges of this life. For those that might be a little offended that we don't get freaked out over all the events in this world. It doesn't mean that we are oblivious or we ignore it. It just means that we're not shaken by all that's happening. See, our problem is this. My problem, your problem, all of our problem is that we gaze at this world and we glance at God. We gaze at this world, we take it in, we obsess over it. We're preoccupied with everything that we see around us. We watch the news six hours a day and it fuels fear and anxiety in our life. We, we gaze at news reporters and we glance at God and as a result, we're afraid and anxious. When we're supposed to glance at the world and, and gaze at God, allow Him to determine our focus. Then I can look at what's happening in my life. I can look at what's happening in the world and it doesn't have to capture me. It, it, it doesn't have to drive me. It doesn't have to force me. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 112. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear in the end because they will look in triumph over their foes. It doesn't see, say that if you trust God, there is no bad news. It doesn't mean that if you believe the good news, there won't be any bad news. No, no. It just means that we will not be afraid. We will not be afraid of a fearful or negative report because our heart is steadfast, trusting in God. I have hope today, not because I believe tomorrow will be ideal. I have confidence today, not because I'm oblivious to the tragedies of this life. I have joy today because I know something like Paul knows it, that the joy before me will cause all the pain in my past or my present to be a dim shadow. That what is to come, the Bible says, the glory that is to come far outweighs anything else that I've ever experienced in my life. I have the confidence and certainty to know that I serve a God who's faithful to his promise, that my hope is secure and founded because my hope is in heaven and I hope yours is as well. There is good news. There is good news. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the good news because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. That's such an interesting statement. Why would anybody be, a, be ashamed of good news? Can I just tell you, church, can I just encourage you in the same way that Paul encourages us, for us in our church, first and most important, cornerstone, foundation of our life and of our church, may it be only and always about Jesus, who he is and what he can do in the life of people. And maybe that's true for you. That's my prayer. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of the good news. I don't know what you're ashamed of. One of the things that I think about, you're only ashamed of things that trigger your insecurity, right? You know, one thing that comes to mind, embarrassment, is a dance floor. Some of y'all love to dance. 
You know, but when I see a dance floor, I get embarrassed. My wife, on the other hand, she has never seen a dance floor she didn't like. Some of you are like, you pa- you're a pastor and you dance. Can I just encourage you? If you're married, you probably should do some more dancing. I'm just letting you know. But me and my wife, we go dancing from time to time. And what that looks like for me is I typically stand here with my hand out. My wife dances around me. That's how that looks. I'm insecure. My body doesn't move that way. I got people watching me. And the reason that I say that, the reason that the Apostle Paul says, don't be, we're not ashamed of the gospel is because it highlights and triggers a place in all of our lives because the gospel is good news to us who receive it. And the only way that we can receive it is we have to understand and appreciate that I'm incapable and I am unable to fix my life on my own. That Jesus is not just here to give you help, but he's here to, to, to de- bring deliverance into your life. And that the reason that it's shameful is you have to admit your own failure and embrace your own weakness so that you can be made fully alive and fully strong. That's what humility is. Admitting that you need a savior and you need deliverance in your life. And by faith, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, which by default means you gotta take second seat, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's as simple as that. And I wanna finish our time together by giving everybody an opportunity to sure up that decision or to make it. So don't we bow our heads if we can. I wanna ask that nobody move just for a moment. Everybody just stay focused here. I believe this moment can change people's lives and hearts. You're gonna be dismissed here in just a second, all right? But if you're here today or if you're watching, listening to this message and you know already you're not where you need to be in your relationship with God, you've never trusted Jesus to be your savior. You never looked to him to be your Lord. You've never asked him to forgive you of your sin. Today's your day. You may have questions without answers. I get all that. You may not know, know everything there is to know, but right now in this moment, I'm believing and I know that you might not even understand how this works, but you feel, you're feeling drawn to make this decision. That decision is drawing you in by the Holy Spirit. Even now, he's drawing you to himself. The Bible says, if, I, if he knocks on the door of your heart, open it up and let him in. And I wanna encourage those of you, you've never trusted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, or maybe you have and you wandered away and you need to renew that commitment. We're gonna have a moment where we're gonna pray a prayer together and we're gonna trust Jesus together to be our Lord and Savior again or for the first time. And I believe that if you need him today, he'll be found by you today. And you can leave here today and it might be you turn on the news and you get the same old news, but you you get to view it from a different place. You can have confidence that he wants to forgive you of your sin. He wants to make you right. He wants to know you in relationship and he wants to give you a concrete hope for your future. The hope of heaven, the hope for security today. So in just a moment, we're gonna pray this prayer, but in your heart, many of you, you need to make this decision. And I, like Paul, I beg you, under the mercies of God, to be reconciled to him, to offer your body because of his mercy as a living sacrifice to him. And if you do, like me, you'll see changes that you can't even imagine. So let's all pray this prayer together. You can pray it repeating after me. Say, God in heaven, thank you for loving me in spite of me. Forgive me of my sin. Make me new. I believe that Jesus died and rose again for me. Say, Jesus, save me and be my Lord. Today, I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we celebrate those folks that made decisions here and all that God has done?